We are honored today to have David Malpass join us, president of the World Bank. David, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be with you, Michael. Well, you feel like you've spent a lifetime preparing for this role that you took over in February of 2019 as the president of the World Bank. And over the decades, you and I have discussed how we finance companies, how we finance countries, the challenges of emerging nations, poorer nations. I'd like to see if we could start today for our viewers from more than 50 countries around the world. What is the mission of the World Bank? Uh, it, it, it used to be uh, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. That was IBRD after World War II to rebuild, and that meant big infrastructure projects. The bank, the World Bank Group, still does some of that, uh, but the broader mission is the actual well-being of people around the world in developing countries. And we measure that by poverty reduction, poverty alleviation, uh, which is a high priority, and also shared prosperity. That means everyone in an economy moving up, and especially people at the bottom moving up. We could measure that in terms of median income going up. So that's our that's our goal. But the the living standards is broadly conceived. So that easily includes health, education, the environment, climate, uh, all of the things that that the humanity thinks of as important for people. Uh, we want that to go up in the even in the poorest countries. That's a hard challenge, of course. So, David, I think there's uh, 189 members today, uh, if I'm correct. And uh, today there's probably more than 7 trillion of transactions on an annual basis. And I think the mission and something you've believed in and I've believed in uh, had drilled into me by my father at a very young age is there won't be a great future for my grandchildren, unless everyone has this great future. And in many ways, you've taken on that responsibility. One of my favorite books was a book called Factfulness. And I remember being at a giving pledge meeting uh, when the facts were being presented. And it was amazing to me uh, how the world had changed. One billion people moved out of extreme poverty when we could get per capita income up to $2,000 a year, you saw dramatic drops in birth rates, increases in opportunity for women. But today, in the depths of an economic challenges brought on by this pandemic, this amazing movement of upward mobility that we've seen over the past couple decades, opportunities for girls, is under challenge. Talk to us about some of the challenges these poorer nations have and how you as the president of the World Bank had tried to have tried to lead the bank in responding to them. The the uh, we just put out new data on on uh, poverty so there's an actual measurement process and uh, uh, every uh, every two years, the bank updates that. So the, the data on extreme poverty shows that it's increased. That's for the first time in really 20 years. So if you think of a number that was going down for 20 years, it was the number of people in extreme poverty as measured by uh, them one, $1.90 per day uh, for the person. You think how little that is, uh, uh, but there there were still 700 million or so in extreme poverty. That's going up, it looks like, by 150 million people uh, as a result of COVID. And that there's a combination of things doing that. One is uh, the, the income of people, uh, the GDP is going down for these countries as part of the recession. That, that pushes a lot of people under the poverty line. But then in addition, remittances coming from their family abroad, working across borders uh, has, has, has dried up. It's gone down substantially. Some of the countries have devalued their currencies. So the actual 
the actual income that a person has in in real terms or in in meaningful terms has gone down and so all of these are combining and then i mean a, a critical factor is the widespread shutdowns of their own economies even if for india for example has had some widespread shutdowns but especially the shutdowns in the advanced economies have really subtracted and then it's not just poverty, but as you mentioned, uh, this this uh, critical, very important uh, 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 growth path where when 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 median income goes above a certain level, you start having better and better social uh, activities and health activities. Violence goes down uh, and health improves. And those are both reversing along with poverty. So we've got a big problem for development, for the concept of development, a very big problem going on right now. Our goal has been to shorten the time to an actual recovery, to where this can start going back up again. I wanted to do this in April uh, by, by emphasizing the importance of fast, broad action. It, unless everyone is making progress, then the world really is going backwards. So we, we ended up with, we've ended up with health programs, new health programs in 111 countries. The, and the paperwork was done in a, you know, World Bank people working from home, working with the governments of the countries were able to put together this um, very widespread program that would allow personal protective equipment, uh, masks uh, to be financed by the World Bank into 111 countries. And the disbursements have been quick in that the countries are accessing the money and buying the equipment. So that's been a very successful concept of our response. And the, to, to, to in the, the, the bigger part of the response over the next year, and then really over the next five years, is how do you really allow countries, help countries, get bigger private sectors, more jobs, including jobs for women and education for girls. These are all, I think, critical in making the advances. I remember when the author of the book, Factfulness, spoke to the Giving Pledge members, and we would assume that this group is the most educated, most worldly among any group in the world. Uh, from that standpoint, that when they asked the question, if there were nine boys in school, how many girls were in school? The number one answer was six, but the correct answer was nine. And this dramatic change that occurred that you've spoken about, David, for 20 years, the rising out of extreme poverty, the opportunity for girls, we have now faced really our first worldwide challenge in this area. Many years ago, I think, David, I used to run in and show you my little formula that I wrote at Berkeley in the 60s, that prosperity formula where access to financial capital served as a multiplier effect on the world's largest asset, human capital. And so I'd like to touch base in the limited time we have today to discuss this area of human capital debt relief. What can we do in responding here and reversing the challenges we're facing and in many ways, which are undoing our advances of the last 20 years. So. How do we build human capital, education, immigration, and health? You've touched base briefly, David, on the enormous response the World Bank has made in the health area to COVID-19, PPP, and others. Let's talk about education uh, and how you see it and the potential loss of trillions of dollars of future income with so many children maybe not going to school today. Uh, that's that's right. So, Michael, over the last oh, three or five years, the, the World Bank uh, established what is called the Human Capital Index to try to quantify some of these concepts. And one key one and the basis of it is called the learning, uh, the learning index or the learning poverty index. And it's the basic idea that a critical dynamic for development is for by age 10, the children, both boys and girls, 
to be able to read a simple story within their native language. Uh, and the problem is it, the percentages are not very high. Uh, and so that that means that the, the person, the child, falls farther and farther behind the world as the years go by. Um, so there's a big effort to try to lift that through you know, better, better literacy programs, better teachers, uh, better uh, access to schools. Um, but with with COVID hitting a, a giant problem in this is we think as many as a billion children are still out of school uh, and the, the in the developing world uh, alone. Uh, and that means um, that and the data shows pretty clearly that when children are out of school, they move somewhat backwards. They move forward when they're in school and backward when they're out of school. So one of our priorities is to get kids back in school through safety to through opening schools in a safe way uh, that can have some social distance but can also get the kids back in for a lot of countries that means the feed the food programs and nutrition programs the vaccination programs those are all driven at the school level and so that that becomes a high priority for what we're trying to do there's we put out one measurement. We put out a big report on the on human capital, exactly your the the way you described in your formula, uh, the on human capital about three weeks ago, and it estimated that the lost uh, learning that's occurring now may cause those children to lose tr ten trillion dollars in income over their lifetimes. That sounds like a huge number, but if you think there's a billion children and they're they're moving backwards you can see that the the long-term stream of their earnings is going down by a lot which is a giant concern for development uh, now i know i know david that you've looked for quick responses and you've been an outspoken advocate for debt relief this year talk to us for a few minutes about that uh, the, so one, the countries need a lot of money, and one of the, and so uh, there, as I mentioned, the you know income is going down for them, and the remittances are going down, uh, and an added uh, issue is as the world has hit into problems, there's a net flow to creditors because most of the creditors. Uh, stop putting as much new money in and and continue wanting to take out their their payments. Um, the World Bank is an exception. We're, we we maintain a very large net positive flow uh, to the to the countries, uh, but for for other creditors that's a challenge. Uh, and so a and with interest rates as low as they are right now, it doesn't do a lot for the country to just delay the payment. Uh, what what we did in March, in in late March, uh, I with Kristalina Georgieva at the at the IMF proposed that there be a moratorium for the debt payments given the severity of the pandemic. The G20 endorsed that and implement, implemented that on, on May 1. So the creditors were supposed to stop taking payments on May 1. Some of them did, but some of them didn't. And the amounts of money that are that are lost then to the poor, this is for the poorest countries that they be, be empowered or that they be allowed to not make the payments uh, and instead devote those payments to healthcare and education in their own countries. But unfortunately, the private sector creditors didn't participate, decided not to participate, which is unfortunate. And some of the large official creditors uh, decided uh, to only partially uh, participate, which is again, unfortunate and that the magnitude the dollars involved are in many many billions of dollars that uh, have been that are being taken out of the poorest countries in order to to uh, uh, repay or to maintain uh, debt service to creditors one other thing I'll mention to you Michael is in general the debt situation for the poorest poorest countries I think has become quite problematic the governments uh, of the countries are often part of the elite and benefit from getting more debt. Uh, but the people of the country are left with the repayments over a cycle. So in many ways, you can think of it as a triangle where the creditors are on one side, the debtors are on a second leg, and the people that, the, I mean, the, the government 
contractors of debt are on a second, and then the people of the country are on a third point of the triangle, and they all have quite different interests in the current mix. So what the World Bank's been trying to do, and we're working hard at it, is to make clear for the world that there needs to be transparency in the contracts, both the debt contracts and the investment contracts, especially in the poorest countries, the, the bottom 75 countries deserve a very fair break for the people of those countries. So that's what we're trying to do both in the, the legal systems and in the, our current effort has been to get the creditors to reduce the dollar amount of the debts. Uh, and that's critical in creating light at the end of the tunnel for the people in the country. The interest of the world, I think, should be in, it's in supporting the people of the poorest countries so that they can invest more in education and health uh, and in, in climate and the environment, the things that make up a good living standard. So David, I think you've been unique in creating this triangle, this concept that the citizens of the country, creditors and their political leaders might not be totally aligned. How do you reconcile this with 10 year debt, 20 year debt, 100 year debt, when most political leaders I'm assuming are focused on the next year rather than the long term? And how do you deal with this issue from both the creditor standpoint and the political leaders in what's in the best interest for the people of the country? Uh, th that's a great question and a big challenge. The, you know, within a, a democratic system, within a rule of law, the governments come and go. They're supposed to come and go. Uh, and But the people stay and pay the debts uh, that were incurred. And so one thing I think that's a high priority is the transparency of these debt contracts. That hasn't been the case uh, uh, up, up in the, over the last 10 years, there has developed a set of contracts that have non-disclosure clauses with the government. So you can wonder about that right away. Why would there be a non-disclosure uh, clause uh, or agreement, a tight agreement written by very careful lawyers uh, between uh, a creditor and the government of a poor country? That's, that's a challenge. And then also collateral is more, more common in these in these uh, creditor relationships. Uh, and that's problematic because it takes the resources from the people of the country uh, away, takes away their resources for a long period of years. Some, some of the contracts are 30 year contracts uh, where the people are supposed to uh, work hard and produce in order to repay debt that was taken out at one moment in time in, 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 uh, it, when, they, when the debt was incurred. So I think the response of the world should be to really insist on transparency. This has been a uh, hard, this has been an uphill battle uh, because of the triangle. There's different, a lot of parts of the international system are against transparency because someone wants an angle, a better, a better part of the deal. Uh, so transparency is uh, has been a big focus, and in, in the in the meetings last week of the of the IMF, the World Bank, the G20, uh, there was um, discussion almost every moment of transparency. Um, so that's one. And then I, th I think debt reduction is we need a process for that. And then a third thing I'll mention, um, Michael, is the importance of the balance between creditors and debtors. Uh, um, you, you, we're, we're very familiar with that in U.S. law, where, where there's, there's a body of law that protects the debtors so that they have full information when they incur a debt and what the interest rate is and and those kinds of things that's not that process is not available for for the poorest countries so we have an odd situation where uh, desperately poor people in poor countries are protected less than than uh, borrowers in in advanced economies so i think that needs to be worked on and another thing is the uh, is the 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 enforcement of contract well the contracts themselves i think need to be written in a way that's more balanced between the creditor and the debtor right now the eurobond contracts are heavily favoring the creditor 
and and that the idea for that is then they'll lend more but the problem for that is when the when the debtor gets into trouble there's really no solution it's very bad for the people of the country so i think we have to look at a system where at least the new money contracts as new money is made available to the poorest countries there should be a fair contract uh established so that that's one principle that uh, we're working on. And then uh, also related to that is the relationship that uh, the developing countries have uh, with China is very important. China has become a very large creditor. In fact, uh, the, 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 our recent data that we put out uh, a couple of weeks ago showed that China was 65% of the de of the uh, credits the 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 credits of the of the uh, of the official bilateral creditors so if you add up all of the official creditors of countries around the world which includes germany and the us and japan and france and so on around the world uh uh of the total amount china is owed 65 percent of it so that becomes a a special situation that needs to be ad addressed in order to allow the countries to move forward our ultimate goal throughout this is for the people of the poorer countries to be able to get ahead David, um, an area that we've spent a lot of time talking about, capitalism. Was it meeting the needs of the people? Plenty of challenges prior to COVID-19. And so the questions here, what role is the World Bank, IMF, and others playing here? And um, as you and I both looked at the 19... 70s and 80s, much of the capital going into the poorer country should have gone in as equity instead of debt, as you then privatized many of these companies as a way of paying off the debt. How do you see the challenges for capitalism, not only what we faced prior to this year, but with COVID-19? You know, they're huge. I don't know that I would characterize it as the problem of capitalism, but the implementation of market systems it has been very hard. And I ended one of the speeches last week, uh, or m probably many of the speeches last week, with a, with a phrase that we want to find a durable model of prosperity that can that can really survive. And that means a balanced rule of law that protects uh, the disadvantaged within an economy. That means uh, women and uh, people with disabilities, but it also means the new entrance into the business, uh, it's small businesses relative to monopoly power that is frequent within the economies. So if you define capitalism as uh, as big corporations taking all the profit to keep wages down, we really need to shake that up and make it a more fair market system uh, that uh, that will work for all of the people within a, within a country. I do think one thing that I'll raise is, that's hard here for us to figure out what to do now in the midst of COVID is this problem of uh, the 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 type of stimulus being used in advanced economies is not available to the poorer countries. So we end up with this highly unequal kind of global advance going on. China reported numbers today of growth in its third quarter. And so China is going to uh, continue uh, probably upward the, the way it has been doing. And the US, Europe, Japan, uh, beginning to see uh, signs of a, of a strong recovery on the other side of COVID, but that's not so much happening for the developing countries. So we have this unequal uh, relationship and contributing that, or one thing that I'll raise is the challenge of, uh, uh, as central banks in the advanced economies buy assets, they're buying the assets that are generally owned by relatively wealthy people. So it contributes and adds to the inequality of this. Perhaps it's in well-meaning in the idea of trying to support the global financial system, but the effect of it is to end up with an unequal kind of, uh, of relationship. Another thing I'll mention 
is the lack of transparency, even in the advanced economies. You know, there's a giant amount of money in public pension funds, uh, but the amount of information, they, they, they have exceptions to a lot of the disclosure rules. So some of the things I was describing for the developing countries uh, actually applies to many of the advanced economies. For example, they don't disclose the outlay projections that have been promised to, uh, to, to uh, retirees. And so that means that you're, you're dealing in a, a creditor debtor situation uh, where the taxpayer is the third part of the triangle. If we use the triangle, you've got someone owning a municipal bond, you've got someone issuing the municipal bond, and then at the third a leg of the triangle, you've got a taxpayer that's ending up with the burden of that over their lifetime. Uh, and it's it's a uh, um, uh, not not a fair balance for the for the people that are ending up with the obligation. So it's very similar to what's faced by the poorest uh, by the poorest countries. The people end up with the burden of the debt. And the solution, I think, is really full transparency of those obligations. David, in closing, I, I want to thank you for your long-term commitment and your focus on the resilience uh, for the people at quote the bottom of the period that make pyramid that make up most of the people on the planet, I'd like to come back to human capital and this issue of education. We've been very focused on nutrition, agriculture, etc., at the Milken Institute over the past ten to twenty years. What, in your leadership of the World Bank? How could we participate, the thousands of people that are watching this, to help build this human capital, this, this amazing thing that's occurred in the past couple decades of rising out of poverty, education, particularly for girls? What can we do to coordinate with the World Bank? Hi. Uh, well, thanks. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, I think uh, the the way I conceive of this progress, it's very much country by country. If you try to look for patterns across the countries, it's very hard to see. Of course, education is applicable to all countries, but it turns out the education system is 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 uh, specific to given countries, and we need to improve them one by one. So the World Bank is able to work in the Democratic Republic of Congo in a different way than in Nigeria. And that's fundamental to getting uh, uh, getting progress. Um, and, and we're talking hundreds of millions of people with their lives and their children at stake in this differentiation, the unique character of the, of the various countries. So it takes uh, uh, some, uh, someone, who's, it takes a global view. The World Bank has that, you know, I worked for in the Reagan administration and on on the same same things way back, and it was part of you know it was summarized maybe too succinctly into the growth the idea of growth. We know now we know that growth has to be broadly conceived for these countries, but it's very individualistic in terms of how countries can achieve it. So the World Bank's doing that, and so I would say. Uh, finding partnerships at the local, at the country level is the critical way for uh, for civil society organizations, for charitable organizations uh, to be engaged. There's a role for this. And then at the, at the national level, um, this means support for programs that actually work for the people of a given country and some, you know, hard-headed evaluation that is done by each nation as they contribute to the global effort. They should be asking, uh, how does this taxpayer money contribute to, to a positive development in individual countries, whether in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, around the developing world? Because I'm, my view is that not all of the programs are are that successful even at the World Bank? There's there are uh, programs that are not really contributing to uh, country development. So I'm trying to have us focused very very much on uh, finding programs that work and then scaling them up so that so that it starts maybe with a hundred thousand people, but then we really need ten million people 
in this uh, this program. I'll give you an example, which is uh, the uh, efficient use of fertilizer. You know, fertilizer is expensive to produce from the standpoint of money and also of the of the environment, uh, and then it's poorly used by a lot of countries. If you can improve the usage of fertilizer, you get a better crop yield, and you can you can really help millions of people within a country but finding a way to do that it's it's very individual uh because the vested interests want you to use their fertilizer which may be the wrong fertilizer for the farmer so finding a way to connect the best interest of the farmer with uh uh with their crops that that needs to be done country by country very aggressively which we're trying to do well, David, I want to thank you for your leadership as president of the World Bank, but also thank you for your lifelong passion for making sure we create the most opportunities for those in the poorest countries with the greatest challenges. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, this is Richard Engel. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm the Chief Foreign Correspondent of NBC News and here to discuss and lead a discussion about the world, about global disorder. And there certainly is a lot of it. If you just look at the world right now, we are in COVID. The United States is facing a pivotal election. There are questions about the stability of American democracy. There are questions about American supremacy. What is going on in the Middle East? What is this new war uh, with Azerbaijan and Armenia? Lots to discuss. And we have a fantastic group of people to lay it all out for the next hour. Uh, joining us are uh, Senator Chris Coombs of Delaware, uh, Neil Ferguson, the uh, historian, uh, former journalist, uh, Jane Harmon, director of the Wilson Center, former congressman, and uh, Sean Karencross. He is the CEO of the Millennium Challenge, which is a, an aid support agency. Uh, he was appointed by President Trump, and previously he was the CEO, COO of the Republican National Committee. So. Let's talk about global disorder. Let's talk about the world that we face in this uh, time of President Trump, in this time of uh, Vladimir Putin, in this time of COVID, uh, in this time of, uh, of China, and it's, uh, some might say, precarious rise. Um, and let me, let me start with, with you, Senator Coons. Uh, President Trump, and, I, and I'm, we're not gonna spend the whole hour discussing President Trump. There are other panels that, that do that, but the US is still the, the, the leading superpower and the US has been going through a very tumultuous period for the last four years. How do you think the, the world sees the United States right now after four years of President Trump? Well, Richard, thanks for the question. And um, thanks uh, to Michael Milliken, the Milliken Foundation. and. Uh, this wonderful panel. It's great to be on with all of you. Um, I think as we will discuss in this coming hour, um, there's sort of two sides to this. First, um, I do think that President Trump has strained our vital alliances, has encouraged authoritarians, and has um, departed sharply from American foreign policy, from what had been a bipartisan foreign policy consensus uh, lasting decades. And if reelected, I think he will continue um, to move us in a direction of isolationism, uh, unilateralism, and nativism that frankly harms our ability to lead the world. Uh, and I, I am a strong supporter of Joe Biden's. Uh, I think if elected the next president, uh, you will see him quickly move to restore our place in the world, to reimagine our global network of alliances and partnerships, uh, and to re-engage in ways that uh, many around the world had come to expect and rely upon for the United States. But let me also say, because I think this is important, um, Sean's with us. He's the leader of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, which is a tremendous organization um, that helps the United States do development differently. It was launched by President Bush. It was sustained by President Obama. It has continued to function really well um, under the Trump administration. There is an enduring bipartisan commitment uh, to doing development responsibly, um, to engaging with the world, 
uh, and there are many of us uh, who have worked in a bipartisan way in Congress uh, to sustain these vital partnerships. Um, and I do think there's um, a record here over the last four years of working together um, that we should just gloss over. I think it is possible for us to continue on a trajectory of engagement with the world if we take a moment and recognize that President Trump's appeal, his isolationist, unilateralist appeal, really resonated with millions of working class Americans who felt <laughs> left out and booked by globalization. If there is a Biden administration, uh, many of us are gonna have to work hard to rebuild a bipartisan consensus that is rooted in helping our engagement with the world make sense to middle-class Americans. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll get to, to Sean in a second, and I wanna talk more about international aid and international engagement, but to, to Jane Harmon, you spend a lot of time thinking about international issues at your position at the, the Wilson Institute. Is America now weaker than it was four years ago? Some might say it's stronger. Some might say that you know President Trump shook the world by its foundations and has been getting some results. Look at what's happening uh, with Israel in the Arab world. What do you think? Well, first, let me thank Mike Milken for this uh, lovely, wonderful international conference. I wish I were there in person. I wish it were in person uh, for two reasons. I'm a resident of Venice Beach, California, and I have four out of eight perfect grandchildren who live in L.A. So um, boo on this virtual conference. On the other hand, Richard, you've got a great panel here. Um, Chris Kuhn said many of the things I agree with. Is America weaker uh, in the world? Yes. Is America weaker as a, uh, a country that is resilient and can heal after this uh, fraught election? Uh, no, actually, I see an opportunity here to accelerate past uh, some of the inertia uh, that we have faced for three decades. This problem didn't start with Donald Trump. I think Chris just said the same thing. I think this problem started after, World, after the Cold War when we didn't have a strategy going forward we under-militarized in the 90s. We over-militarized after 9-11. Uh, and uh, because of our adventures, or some would say misadventures in the Middle East, we missed China's rise. So, so I think uh, what we can do now are some of the things Joe Biden is saying, build back better. It's a wonderful phrase. In other words, use uh, uh, a modern, clean infrastructure to put people back to work, to develop the best in the world technology and also promote our values again so that some kid in his basement in the United States or in some cafe in the Middle East uh, is not enticed by bad messages from extremist uh, uh, folk, but says, gee, the United States is that shining city on the hill that Ronald Reagan once said it was. All right, I'm gonna throw a question to Neil. I'm seeing on his Zoom screen that he's using some sort of old black and white photograph. While it's very appealing, I'm not sure if he can hear me. Uh, the, the question is, Neil, is democracy dead? Is human rights dead? Are these things ideals that we should uh, look back nostalgically upon? If you, you look at the world right now, it doesn't seem to be one in which, I don't wanna say the nice guys win, but it doesn't seem to be, there don't seem to be consequences for violators of human rights, violators of democratic freedoms. Are those, have those been relegated to the past? Well, you know, in fact, I think that Putin showed no really major uh, retreat by democracy, although the headlines are constantly warning us of this. Uh, in, in reality, uh, when I think it was in the mid-1990s, uh, Fareed Zakaria wrote a book predicting the rise of a liberal democracy, that there would be at least a decline in, in, in liberals, uh, liberal principles. It, it, we're not really in a radically different place uh, in 2020 compared with then. Remember, although the, the most populous country in the world is a totalitarian state, albeit one with good public relations, namely China, uh, the next largest is a, a vibrant, if occasionally chaotic, democracy, uh, namely India. I actually think if you look at how uh, countries have handled COVID-19, the most successful...
successful countries in managing this pandemic have actually been the East Asian democracies. Uh, Taiwan uh, and South Korea have both done notably well. Uh, and Japan, too, has had a remarkably smooth ride and is, if anything, an advertisement for stable democracy. So I think we mustn't fixate too much on a few headline-grabbing uh, cadillos or strongmen. We must recognize that, in fact, democratic systems are superior. They, they actually do cope better because their leaders are accountable. Putin's handling of uh, COVID-19 has not been good uh, for Russia. So I think that's the first point. The second point I'd make, Richard, is that if anything, human rights is a more important component of international relations than ever. Even if President Trump doesn't give the impression of caring very much personally about such things, actually the U.S. response, uh, and I'd say also the global response to violations of, of human rights uh, it, by China, uh, has been uh, impressive, at least uh, rhetorically, if not in terms of, of substantive action. So I actually think a Biden administration, as uh, that's the most likely scenario uh, mm -hmm. next year, will find it relatively easy uh, to uh, add uh, to the uh, chorus of complaint about, for example, the way the Uyghurs are being mistreated in Xinjiang, uh, in China. Uh, that, that seems to me to, to, to actually point in a relatively encouraging direction. So I'm much less worried by, for democracy and human rights than your question implied. All right. Good. To, to Sean, uh, I think you are also joining us. You deal uh, with aid and making sure that aid around the world is, is efficient, is productive. What about, the, what about these last four years? Has it been more difficult to sell the American model? There's, the, there's talk about the Chinese model versus the American model. And the American model has always been the Americans, uh, you, you get a fair shot, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you come to America, you work hard, and it defends the underdog. But not everyone really sees that as the American model anymore. Uh, how has it been in your experience when, when inter interacting with the world? Is it harder to, to sell America? I see you're sitting in front of a, of a flag. I want to know what that what that perspective has been like for the last several years uh, from where you sit. Sure. Well, thank you, Richard. And it's so nice to see everyone on the panel. I want to make sure to thank the Milken Institute and Mike uh, Milken in particular for hosting this event. And I guess I'd start by saying I just got back from Sierra Leone 36 hours ago. And part of our trip to Sierra Leone was the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which I uh, am the CEO of, is engaged in opening fresh water kiosks in Freetown. We are in the neighborhood of Aberdeen, and for the first time, that neighborhood has access to clean running water. It's pumped into homes. We we're talking to a 65-year-old lady who's never had running water in her house at all. The village itself has never had access to clean water. The, the town was there and cheering. They were grateful. It is a fantastic partnership with the Sierra Leonean government. And so it's really a testament to the power of the United States to make a difference in people's lives. And I would follow up on something that the senator uh, said, and Senator, it's great to see you again. He and his colleagues on both sides of the aisle on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Trump administration, as with uh, other administrations in the past, is very supportive of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And one of the reasons for that is it takes development a little bit differently. As you touched on, there is a debate about the use of U.S. taxpayer dollars in foreign development. And one of the things that builds consensus and confidence in that effort is when an agency can show real results. And we are a, an agency that's focused on transparency. We're focused on accountability. We work with our host uh, partner countries as a, uh, as a counter to the Chinese model. And that confidence and that bipartisan support that we have uh, that we've enjoyed really, I think, sets 
uh, a good case for U.S. development efforts. And I would just say, finally, one of the things that is lesser known about the Trump administration is the more coordinated approach on foreign development and the inclusion of the private sector in that increasingly. We've seen that with the creation of the Development Finance Corporation and our work together with the DFC to bring increasing private capital into these markets and into our projects to build lasting sustainable development. So Richard, the short answer to your question is everywhere I've been uh, representing the United States, it's been a personal matter of pride for me. It's been met with an enormous amount of gratitude from the host governments. And we have fantastic partnerships that we're looking forward to doing more with. But then how do you explain that so many diplomats in the U.S. State Department have been signing letters of protest, have been uh, resigning, have say that they are finding it difficult to represent the United States at this time. I understand if you're giving out fresh water to people who don't have it, they're going to be appreciative. But what about the larger issue of representing the United States and really trying to to sell the American model abroad when that model right now is going through such a, a precarious time. And I think we can all accept that. Well, let's, let's talk about that model for just a second, because what our agency does is it selects partner countries based on their progress in three broad areas, democratic rights, economic freedom, and a government's investment in their own people. We then engage with those governments to design specific projects to get at the root causes of economic uh, underdevelopment and to address them. And working with those governments, we then set up an entity in country. It's independent. It's got its own CEO. It's got its own board of directors. It's got its own project design firm. And they go about and deal not only with the project design, but the elements of civil society that are going to be affected by that work. So if we're talking about land reform or agriculture and there's going to be displacement, that's an effort that goes through a series of meetings to make sure that those stakeholders are taken into account. Women's economic empowerment, uh, meeting with uh, SME owners and developers, young women who are were, we're engaged in uh, training and education programs with, to make sure that our projects are not only economically viable, but they're lasting and sustainable when we leave. And so in talking to foreign heads of state, one of the things that's come up repeatedly is the American way of doing this, the transparency, the merit-based hiring, the open procurement, best, best money for, uh, best value for the dollar. In our procurement guidelines, it's open. If you want to bid on our projects, go ahead and bid. The, the best bid is going to win. The only, the only uh, restriction on that is no state-owned enterprises. And so that there's local capacity building in the workforce and the, and the labor market. And it is something where the governments are engaged in a conversation with the private sector that in many cases, it hasn't happened before. And that sort of, um, and that dialogue hasn't existed. And it, it's a partnership where the United States is working hand in hand with those countries to provide basic goods and services and hard infrastructure to benefit their people. I mean, I think this is a fantastic example of what the United States is capable of doing abroad. And it's something that uh, builds confidence. Like I say, all our projects by statute, Richard, it's five years. We have to finish on time and on budget once the shovel goes in the ground. Not a single MCC compact in its history has gone over budget, not a single one. And all of our results are monitored and tracked and that they're available to the American public for the rest of the world. In fact, we were just ranked again, the number one uh, government agency for transparency and publish what you fund. So that model of American ingenuity, of smart risk taking, of accountability and transparency is something that we represent around the world every day and we're proud of our partnerships. And no one's ever asked you if the, the president of the United States shares the same values and transparency that you, your organization does? 
Well, I know that the president of the state and all yeah. the places, you know, all the engagements. And, I, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. It, it's, it's a real thing. I, I go out and as an American, I interact with people. And sometimes, often, one of the first things they want to know about me is what's going on in the United States. So if you're going out and interacting, uh, interacting with people and interacting with foreign governments at a senior level, and you're talking about transparency, it's never so, happened to you. They push it back on you and say, what about your own government? I have dealt with- What about your own administration, I should say? Yeah, well, a couple of things. The first thing, Richard, I'd say is, I know that the president is a strong supporter of MCC. The administration is a strong supporter of MCC. In fact, we did a women's economic empowerment trip to Morocco with Ivanka Trump, who is spearheading the WGDP initiative. It was a great trip. We visited and leveraged a constitutional change in Morocco and the implementing texts, which give women in Morocco inheritance rights on land for the first time ever. It's an inspiring model. And, and moreover, in every single conversation I've had with every foreign head of state, they have been thankful to the United States, they've been appreciative, and they have been wanting to engage MCC and the US more. In fact, the question I usually get is, how can you get more US business engaged in uh, in this project and in our market. And part of the message that, that we have is we, we don't operate like China. We don't send our companies abroad and subsidize them. It's the best value for dollar. And so what we try to do is work domestically with the private sector to get those bids in. And where US companies bid, they tend to win about 75% of the time, but we need to get that word out. And that's the, that's the MCC model. It's got a ton of support from President Trump. It's got a ton of support from the administration and it's continued to enjoy bipartisan support on the Hill. And it's, I think, a remarkable thing. R Richard, the bottom line is this agency, I think more than any other in government, helps make the case to the US taxpayer and all sides of the foreign development debate, debate that US foreign development can achieve impactful results and uh, and make a real difference in the world uh, better than almost anything else. Uh, Jane, a, a question for you, and yeah. thank you very much, Sean. And while uh, Sean may not be hearing it from the people he's talking to, uh, when I talk to NATO officials, I hear a great deal of concern that the United States has changed, that the United States' commitment to its alliances, the commitment to its treaties and agreements is not the same. And this is these, these alliances uh, have formed the basis of our relations, maybe the basis of the United States' success uh, since World War II. So, so Jane, if there is another four years of, of, of President Trump, and I, I know you said you, you don't want that, but if there is, can NATO survive or is it the end of NATO? Well, let me answer that, but first to say to Sean that the Millennium Challenge Corporation is a best practice of the United States. It really is successful. I believe it was George Bush 43 who set it up and who's passionately interested in it. Kudos to you, him, and others uh, who I think President Obama supported it enthusiastically too. So yay. But I think it is sadly one of the few examples we now have of uh, the U.S. engaging in soft power effectively around the world. And that's a big problem. Our hard power is uh, a mixed bag. We need to have it, but exercising it, uh, this is my point about over-militarizing after 9-11. Uh, we would have been better in many ways showing more soft power. So to answer the question about NATO, which is a defense alliance nonetheless, I think this administration sadly has uh, not just questioned the value of NATO uh, and Article 5, the, the common defense provision, which NATO invoked uh, without being asked uh, one time in its long history, and that was after 9-11. So let's understand that NATO is an alliance that really wants our back, uh, not just others. But this whole business about paying proper dues, I don't think it's wrong. Uh, but I think if that's the only message to NATO, it, it misses the mark. The, the message to NATO needs to be, let's modernize for our common defense and, and have the right buffer 
uh, against Russian aggression. I think that's the message to NATO, by the way. But anyway, NATO is one, but so is support for the EU. So is our withdrawal from trade, trade alliances and, and non-proliferation treaties. I think the message to the world is that the U.S. is withdrawing and the U.S. is certainly shrinking its soft power. AID is being uh, underfunded. The State Department is underfunded. There are huge vacancies in, in ambassadorships and uh, the Foreign Service feels unsupported. And so, uh, you know, I, I, again, I want Sean to hear me. This is a good message. You're doing the right things, uh, but you are, are pretty much alone at the moment. So, Jane, just to push you a little further, I'm not quite sure I heard an answer. If there is four more years of, of President Trump, we know what he says about NATO. Does he disband it? Is he, does he make it, no. walk away from it to the point that it is almost no, I, obsolete? I hope not. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, a, I, I had the nonpartisan Wilson Center. I am a card carrying Democrat, but please hear my answers in terms of a uh, of a kind of a broader view. I don't think Trump withdraws from the from NATO. We have a very able ambassador right now who's my good friend, Kay Bailey Hutchison, a former uh, uh, United States Senator from Texas, who is out with the message. I know this because I've been with her and I've actually stayed with her in Brussels that the US is committed to NATO. And she's worked very, she personally has worked very effectively with NATO, but I think some of the rhetoric uh, has been unhelpful and uh, I, I'm suggesting that if the president, if he is reelected, talks about a, a, a constructive future f with, with NATO, where it's not anything like a two-tier alliance where some of us provide uh, most of the money and most of the assets and others don't, uh, I think that that would be constructive. And I think it's possible that Trump could do it. I know that uh, uh, Vice President Biden would do it. So dare I do it. I'm going to try one more for, for Neil, because I, I know you have strong thoughts on, on this, which uh, we've discussed together and which I've read. But I want to set up this question uh, with a bit of a contrary uh, point to, to what you normally make. Your general point is that China is, has been hurt badly by COVID and that, and you can explain it better than I will, but I'm just setting up the argument here. Your general point is that China has been hit badly by COVID. People are angry with China and that we in the media and, and in, in formats like this give China too much credit. But it seems that China already has climbed out of COVID. Their economy is starting to make a, uh, a quick recovery and China did manage to get through COVID, not just through the disease, but get through any of the political mess that we've seen in the, in the US. Uh, so not only did it get through the virus, it got past whatever social pressures may have, uh, have been caused by it, and it's starting to have an economic recovery. So does China emerge post COVID stronger? Well, Richard, uh, everyone on this call has been pretty critical of, uh, of President Trump implicitly or explicitly. But I think it's worth uh, pointing out that uh, the alarm was raised uh, about NATO uh, four years ago, and NATO is still intact. So just to answer your question to Jane, I don't think there's any reason to think that NATO couldn't survive another four years of the Trump administration. Actually, I think it's better to judge the administration by its acts rather than by his tweets. And the most important thing about the Trump administration, and this is what future Can historians will say, is that Can you do that? that Can you separate the, the acts from the tweets? You know, if you're in a relationship, it's hard to separate what somebody says from what they do. It's all part of the same thing, because for, if, for a present anyway, words are action. Words are, are have meaning, or should anyway. Actually, Richard, there is a difference between words and actions. And I think the most important thing about the administration, as I said, future historians will say, is that it changed direction on China. It completely altered the direction of U.S. policy towards China, case when essentially acquiescing and indeed encouraging the rise of China was policy. And I think it was right to change direction. This is something you can trace back to the national security strategy that my now colleague at the Hoover Institution, H.R. McMaster, uh, 
spearheaded. Uh, regarding China as a rival, mm -hmm. indeed as a strategic challenger, is the right and has been the right thing to do. Now, if you look at the COVID-19 crisis, two things are very clear. One, that China started this. It was China's fault that this virus spread as far as it did, because for weeks, uh, through December to January, the Chinese authorities, both at the local and national level, were not straight with the world about the extent of the problem, about the nature of human-to-human -human transmission. Even although Chinese scientists and doctors were trying to get the message out, they were silenced. And it took until uh, the, the third week of January for the Chinese to cut off uh, transport from uh, China to the rest of the world. Uh, during that time, the virus spread to pretty much every continent, including, of course, North, North America. Uh, the second point to make is that, yeah, China was able to bring COVID-19 under control domestically, but through extraordinary draconian measures, including even incarcerating people uh, in their apartments, welding the doors if necessary in, uh, in Wuhan, methods that no democracy could really possibly uh, adopt. So what we've seen in China has been a demonstration of the power of the Communist Party to impose total social control and surveillance on its population. Uh, that means that China has been able to uh, cover economically more rapidly, uh, but that's partly because it had the, the, the pandemic first, and it's been able to use these incredibly draconian measures to bring it under control. It's still only going to grow about 1.9% this year, according to the latest IMF projections, which for China is a very low growth rate. And I think the key thing to watch here is uh, what exactly will the effects be on China's system of this huge crisis that they've had to uh, go through? I don't think it's self-evident that China is somehow the winner of 2020 just because uh, the United States has made very heavy weather of managing the pandemic. I think there are profound problems with a totalitarian system, an excessively centralized system, one in which one man, Xi Jinping, has almost all the power. I think ultimately it will prove to be a less resilient system uh, over, let's say, a five to ten year time frame. We will see five to ten years. This year, they certainly have been having have some ups and downs. They also managed to reimpose security control in Hong Kong and got that without paying much of a price. So whether they're long term, what makes you so convinced, uh, Neil, aside from the ideological argument that democracies are better than totalitarian regimes, which is a strong one. What, aside from that, what makes you so bearish on, on China? They seem to be getting away with what they want to get away with, whether it's the well, Uyghurs I'll, or Hong Kong. I'll, I'll give you two reasons, Richard. First of all, uh, China's economy was already slowing, partly for demographic reasons and for, uh, because of the excessive burden of debt accumulated in recent years. COVID-19 has brought the growth rate down much faster than anyone would have anticipated uh, a year ago. And so China is now staring a low growth rate in the face. I don't think its economy is going to bounce back to vastly higher growth rates in the coming years. Secondly, the debt problem is only getting worse because generate 1% growth is that once again uh, they're hitting uh, the fixed asset investment button, financing it with the government and other debt. So I think the underlying problems of the Chinese system uh, haven't gone away. If anything, uh, these problems have been intensified by the pandemic. I'll say one last thing as my, in my capacity as a historian. Uh, we in the West have a terrible habit of overestimating totalitarian regimes and underestimating ourselves. In the 70s, we, we thought uh, American democracy was going to hell, American power was going to hell, and the Soviet Union was going to win the Cold War. That's completely wrong. I in a 21st century world uh, of extraordinary connectivity that a totalitarian system modeled fundamentally on the Marxist-Leninist principle of democratic centralism, can possibly be viable. And I'll say one final thing. If you want to see a country that handled the COVID-19 pandemic really well, don't look at the Republic of China. Look at the Republic of China, Taiwan. Now, Taiwan is a tremendous advertisement for democracy. Uh, the trouble is that there's a major threat to its long-run independence uh, and democracy, and that threat is, of course, posed by Beijing. And one of the things the Trump administration has been doing well, I think, in the last year or so is sticking up and showing that the 
United States does uh, fundamentally support its de facto autonomy. Senator, Senator Coons, on the uh, continuing in the vein of Marxism-Leninism, what about Russia? <laughs> um, Russia is sometimes portrayed as a boogeyman that if you, you know, open up any electoral box, uh, you're going to find a Russian troll inside trying to, you know, or disinformation campaign in, in your in your inbox all, all over the place. But Russia clearly has uh, an, an agenda. Cl Russia clearly sees this as, as a moment for it to 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 shine. Uh, how big of a threat would you say Russia is uh, and Vladimir Putin is to the American electoral system, America's position in the world? Uh, do we over exaggerate the threat of Russia and, and Putin or or is is he really you know playing his poker hand exceptionally well while we keep dropping aces and, and not really uh, keeping track of our cards? Well, thanks for the question, Richard. I do think that Vladimir Putin, trained as a KGB agent, is playing a weak hand exceptionally well in terms of the disinformation campaigns mm -hmm. that Russia has launched, both covertly and overtly, uh, not just uh, to uh, interfere in America's 2016 election and now on a broader scale in our 2020 election, but across all of the democracies of Eastern, Central, and Western Europe. Uh, one of the things that the average American, I, I wish, knew better uh, was the ways in which Russia has been a persistent, engaged, and effective um, interference in, in everything about the West. Part of our challenges with the EU, our challenges with NATO have been exacerbated, uh, both internal divisions in countries all over Europe uh, and internal divisions within the United States and divisions between the United States and NATO. Um, Putin sees it in his own self-interest, his security interest, in Russia's vital national interest, uh, to be engaged in uh, forays, whether it's in Ukraine and uh, the annexation of Crimea and the ongoing interference in the Donbass, uh, or uh, destabilizing Libya or um, their adventure in Syria. And to my surprise, frankly, they've been more successful in these undertakings than I might have expected. Uh, in the long run, uh, as Richard was just saying, I just don't see how Putin and the Russian model is viable. I am much more concerned about China um, China is exporting its model of digital authoritarianism. Um, it has um, remarkably uh, grown over the decades and is now a peer competitor in cutting edge and innovative technologies, uh, in building out its global network through the Belt and Road Initiative uh, of alliances or of debtor states, client states, and partners. Uh, and I think if we are not more united in our focus, both on strengthening the United States and tending to our own internal divisions and allowing our democracy uh, to show that it can solve the problems of real people in our country. If we don't tend to that first and reimagine and rebuild our global network of alliances, uh, we will have our hands more than full dealing with China and Iran and Russia and North Korea. The United States is a resilient and capable democracy. I am optimistic, particularly if Joe Biden is our next president. Um, but we've got some real challenges. And I've been struck at how clearly, uh, forcefully, and repeatedly uh, the head of the FBI, Chris Ray, Director Ray, um, the former uh, Director of National Intelligence, uh, Senator Coates, um, have warned over and over that Russia is interfering in our 2020 election. Uh, and while there have been some significant bipartisan moments where uh, the Senate, the Congress has stood up and imposed uh, significant sanctions, even over the reluctance or even objection of President Trump. Uh, I am at the broader level concerned that we have failed to meet this moment. So if we get through the critical stress test of our presidential election coming now just over two weeks from now, um, and if we tend to rebuilding not just the physical infrastructure of the United States and making it more resilient, but rebuild the functioning of our democracy, uh, I'm optimistic that the 21st century can still be a century where the American model appeals to the world and is ultimately successful, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work pulling together. The Belt and Road Initiative, uh, it's one of these, the biggest things that's going on in the world that few people have ever heard of. 
Uh, it is this massive infrastructure project. I, I liken it to the, the Silk Road or the, the Roman Road. It is a network of infrastructure, bridges, ports, uh, roads that all lead back to China to establish a new Chinese trade route. And Senator, one of the things that I found interesting is when we were doing a, a little get together like this just to make sure all the connections worked, I guess Neil wasn't on it, that you mentioned that the United States is pushing its own version of a Belt and Road initiative. Could you tell us more about that? And does it have any possible chance of success? Because China is quite famous. It can, it can show up into an African country, bring a, a labor force quickly, set up camp, and lay down highway in, in a miraculously quick amount of time. Uh, can the United States, should even the United States try to compete with that? Yes, well, um, thanks for a chance to talk about this for a moment, Richard, because I think it is one of the great successes uh, of bipartisan legislating, uh, of standing up a new, um, stronger, more competitive uh, global development finance institution. Uh, Adam Bowler, who is leading it, uh, enjoys broad bipartisan support, including uh, vocally from me. Uh, he is a great partner with Sean and the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, and I think supersizing OPIC, uh, giving this 40-year-old uh, modestly um, uh, resourced and modestly um, uh, enabled statutorily institution and really beefing it up to be a capable competitor to Chinese sources of infrastructure finance is a big success. Uh, President Trump signed the BUILD Act into law. Uh, I worked across the aisle with uh, Republican and Democratic partners in both the House and the Senate to get it uh, ready to go. Uh, but is it just I moving now? Is there actually a, an American global infrastructure project to link the global economies back to uh, the U.S. economy? Or is this just sort of a, a pie in the sky? Uh, Richard, the Development Finance Corporation is up and running and running well. Um, they have a significant amount uh, of capital um, to use both equity investment and uh, debt and to do things that the OPEC could never do, um, to lend in foreign currencies, uh, to bring in partners that are non-U.S. nationals, uh, and to syndicate with our critical allies around the world. Um, this is a forceful response to the Belt and Road Initiative. And just to go back for a moment to your characterization, yes, the Chinese uh, are fully capable of quickly mobilizing uh, a Chinese labor force, of delivering capital and building infrastructure. I've been to dozens of countries over the last decade where they've been doing so, but they tend to overpromise and underdeliver. Um, the quality of their infrastructure projects is not comparable to the quality of American designed and built projects. The ways in which their projects are not transparent and lead to dramatic increases in graph, the ways in which the debt being taken on is not sustainable. Um, these are things that Sean was speaking to earlier. We have a real opening here to demonstrate that American private capital and American leadership in partnership with our critical allies, the Brits, the Germans, the Japanese, the Australians, the South Koreans, the Nordic countries, we really can engage, compete, and win in a global competition. And the Belt and Road Initiative hasn't delivered the number, the scale, or quality of projects that they initially had promised. So I think this is a critical next step in our global competition. And it's an area where democracy is working in the United States where genuine bipartisanship has begun to deliver billions of dollars in new financed projects that can compete head to head with the Chinese. Richard, can I add one thing? Can of you course you may. All right. I, I certainly agree with Chris, but I wanted to say something even Neil would agree with. And that is that China's powerful, but it's not popular. China's form of government, China's heavy handed management of the BRI uh, uh, around the world, and it's imposing its own labor force and not hiring locals is very unpopular. And then you add to the worldview that China mismanaged the uh, coronavirus uh, issue. You could argue that the U.S. didn't do a good job either, but China initially mismanaged it. Uh, and I think we have an opportunity not to uh, uh, imitate the BRI, but to be better than the BRI. And a shout out again to Sean 
uh, for in a in a in a micro form doing it right in Africa. So let's see if we can uh, in the next administration, uh, even in a Trump administration, uh, build on uh, what we do well. And I I don't I don't see why we can't outcompete the Chinese. So Sean, everyone seems to be giving you props for this. So tell us more about it. Do you think that the United States can have its own BRI Belt and Road Initiative? Can we build an American road? Can we make it so all roads lead to New York and Seattle and Los Angeles of, of commerce and trade and thoughts? And uh, is this possible? And is it happening? Or is this just something that you know happens in conversations like this and uh, maybe some legislation is, is passed, but then the, the bridges and the roads don't actually get built? No, no it's, it's definitely, definitely happening. happening. The first, first thing I'd, I'd say, say is, is with respect, with respect to President Trump, I think history is pretty clear with respect to U.S. foreign engagement abroad. If there's not consensus at home, the effort overseas is going to be weakened. And specifically with respect to development, there are plenty of legitimate questions about the United States' past history with development, how it's been done, how it's been implemented, and what its effects were. And that's why in 2004, this agency was created specifically to do things differently. And it's enjoyed support from a Republican administration, a Democrat administration, and now the Trump administration. One of the things that President Trump did was sign into effect bipartisan legislation, the AGOA and MCC Modernization Act, that allowed MCC for the first time in its history to not only do bilateral projects, which we call compacts with partner countries, but to do regional compacts, concurrent compacts with more than one country together. And so right now we're working to operationalize that. We're looking at a transportation corridor, for example, between Burkina Faso and Benin, Ouagadougou down to uh, the port of Cotonou that would make an entire region able to get goods and services to the port and to import as well. That's something that's brand new. The Development Finance Corporation, which can now go up to, OPEC could do 30 to 35 billion, and the Development Finance Corporation go, can go up to 70 in backing private capital into these markets. We're working closely with the DFC. We've got a couple of new um, things that we're rolling out and, and collaborating. That's part of the Build Act legislation that was signed uh, under this president to work closely together. And so what we see is the United States model, it's not set up, and I think this is a very important distinction to make, Richard, it's not set up to compete with the Chinese model dollar for dollar. That's, it makes no sense to do that. What it's designed to compete with is on model. And that model is access to those capital markets, bringing in that private investment, putting sustainable, economically viable projects in place. So if you're in Mozambique, for example, where we just launched a project development last year, a bridge that's built in Maputo that has no one crossing it makes no sense. It's not economically viable. It's going to drive the Mozambican debt up. I've, I've dealt with one foreign minister who sat down at a table and read me the riot act. Where was America 10 years ago? China was here. They were building this. They were putting up stadiums. And my question was, well, how is that working out for you? And he said, yeah, actually, decisions were taken. Get it go. No economic analysis was done. We're in trouble and we need help. And what All we're right. offering is a partnership. Great. We've talked a lot about China. Richard, if I could just be clear, All right, Sean. Last one on China, and then I really want to talk about the Middle East, because if we got to get the whole world, I see my countdown clock, we have 11 minutes. So please, Senator, go ahead, but, but keep it to a minute if you can. The Development Finance Corporation has up to $60 billion uh, in mm -hmm. capital capacity. I just wanted to make clear that it's, uh, it, it is not the same as the scale of the Belt and Road Initiative, but it is a significant um, move into doing international development financing. So let's see. Let's see if uh, $60 billion and Chinese failures in the past and clean contracting can can work. Yeah. 
We will see. I guess we'll, we'll meet again in five years and we'll see if it, if it worked or not. What's going on in the Middle East? And for that, if uh, Neil can help me out here. Since 1979, Iran has been seen as the, the great destabilizer in, in, in the region. But more increasingly, uh, we're hearing about Turkey, also Iran, but Turkey being a, a bigger uh, country of concern, particularly in, in parts of the Arab world. Is a shift underway? Has has Turkey become the the new disruptor or the new nemesis, the new challenger in the in, in the Middle East? How, how would you uh, how would you see things as a as the role of the, uh, the historian among us? Well, Richard, you're uh, too modest. Uh, you probably know more about uh, Turkey than anyone else on this uh, call, and maybe I'll lure you out of your moderator's role to answer your own question. But the interesting problem that Turkey presents is that it's on paper an ally, and we're always being told that mm -hmm. we should really care about NATO and we should be very concerned about our allies. But, but actually, uh, Turkey is uh, not even a frenemy. It acts essentially as a hostile power. It poses uh, threats uh, region-wide in all kinds of uh, different uh, crisis spots from Libya uh, to Syria uh, to the eastern Mediterranean where it gives the Greeks a uh, headache. It's even been meddling in Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're right, I think, to say that uh, that Turkey is one of the new troublemakers in the region, but, uh, but it's a funny kind of troublemaker because on paper it's an American ally. Of course, uh, Iran hasn't stopped being a troublemaker. I still think it's a worse troublemaker. And here I think one of the most important things that the Trump administration has got right compared with its predecessor uh, has been not to try to appease or cajole Iran into some kind of uh, agreement they don't sincerely intend to keep, but rather to isolate Iran and to build a coalition extending all the way uh, from Israel to Saudi Arabia to, to contain Iran. And this has been one of the big diplomatic achievements of the Trump presidency, not much trumpeted in the media because it's so much easier to knock the administration. But really, the breakthroughs that we've seen recently uh, with uh, Israel establishing uh, diplomatic ties uh, with uh, Arab countries, first of all, the, the United Arab Emirates, uh, this, I think, is a major geopolitical shift, which leaves Iran in a much, a much weakened position. And what, therefore, can be done? Do you think Turkey, which is NATO ally, on paper a close American ally, can it be brought back into the fold? Uh, the, the, uh, Turkey and Russia were, were, were becoming fast friends, but that uh, has gone cold a, a little bit. So do you, think, do you think this can change? Can Turkey and, uh, under President Erdogan be, be brought back? Or is this a strategic I, shift? I doubt it, frankly, uh, Richard. I mean, I think under President Erdogan, Turkey has pursued a distinctly erratic course uh, early on. It seemed as if he had delusions of uh, Ottoman grandeur, but most of those, I think, have crumbled away. I, I argued four years ago that uh, the Trump administration uh, should seek to uh, jettison Turkey from NATO and recognize that Turkey no longer can seriously be considered an ally. Uh, that hasn't happened, and I think it's, it, it's really led to a strange anomaly. Uh, we have habits that date back a long, year, a long way uh, when it comes to our arms sales and military bases. Uh, uh, these are, these are kind of hardwired in, in the minds of many people in the American military. But when you think about it uh, uh, diplomatically, in terms of Turkey's conduct, this relationship is over, and I think it would be in the best interest of NATO uh, if it simply uh, if it simply told Turkey, "Thanks for the memory, uh, goodbye." And, and Jane, this is obviously a very polite conversation. Everyone's trying to express themselves and think deeply about these issues, and I think we've all been very flattering to one another and been very flattering about the American model. But realistically, when I talk to people, and they, they see the United States as a total mess right now uh, under President Trump. And, and I'm not saying that because of my personal view. I, that happens to me daily, and I'm, and I'm sure it happens to, to some of you as well. Do you think this, 
this vaunted American model that's going to spread the Belt and Road Initiative, that's going to uh, move on, has been negatively impacted by, by President Trump. And do you think that can be fixed? I know you want, Pres uh, you want Vice President Biden to be elected. Do you think that's enough to undo the, the damage that the last four years have caused in terms of uh, public perception? Okay, um, I'm going to answer in a broader way because it's what I really believe. I don't think after the uh, Cold War ended peacefully, remember that was an exercise of very effective soft power by Ronald Reagan and others. I don't think we had a roadmap for what came ahead. We were hubris, infected by hubris, and we thought we were the indispensable power, the only one, and everyone wanted to be us. Well, guess what? They don't. And I think that President Trump was elected in part because of the frustration of many Americans about being left out. Uh, and I think some of his moves have been bold and good, paying attention initially to North Korea, but that fizzled. Uh, you know, and, and some of the things in the Middle East that he's done have been good in my view, although uh, I worry very much about isolating Jordan, our, our, our major ally there, and about pulling out of the Iran Accord, which I think could have been made stronger if we'd stayed in it, but I, we don't have to go there. I think that uh, tr blaming Trump for all this is wrong. However, I think this is time for a major reset. I hope he will do it if he's reelected. I'm not that confident. But I think that uh, President Biden has to restore our relationships around the world, has to restore some of the basic treaties that we've pulled out of, like the Paris Accords, and that should be made stronger, uh, has to reinvest in NATO. And do I think we can do this and America can, can wipe some of the tarnish off the silver? I absolutely do. I think that the model we developed after World War II, uh, it, you know, the old, the liberal order has to be a much more, a much bigger tent and more people have to prosper under the liberal order and, and globalization has to serve more people and digitization has to serve more people and we have to take the cobwebs off some of the alliances. But I'm very hopeful that uh, the world wants, does not want the Chinese model, wants a restored, renewed democratic model and we can be a huge architect of that. All right, we have Richard, three minutes as left. A, as a member of the administration on the on the event, can I just quickly? I was going to you. I was going to you. So we have three minutes left, and I want to get to everybody. Sean, uh, to you, what happens if President Trump gets elected to the world? Not what happens to the United States. Other panels can talk about that. The next day, there's some conclusion that says yes, he in fact won. What happens to the world? Does the world get in line and say, no problem, let's all work? Is there a, a paradigm shift? What happens to Listen, America's the, place in the world? You, you know as well as I do, the world never says, we're all gonna get on and, and do one thing. But what will be clear and what has been clear is particularly with respect to US engagement on the development side, those agencies will continue to work closely together. That sort, of, that sort of approach, the pushing of the American model, the work that the State Department is doing on 5G and clean networks, mm -hmm. the recognition that China is a rival, that they are, they are active globally in seizing sovereignty from, uh, from nations around the world is growing. That's not, I believe, reversible, I, and thankfully it's not. And so the more that we can build the American network in these countries and network upon network becomes more and more powerful, the more persuasive, the more results-based uh, evidence we'll have that it works, the more support we'll have with our partner countries, and the more support, importantly, we'll have from the American taxpayer on U.S. efforts. Senator Coons, uh, we are minute out. So if uh, Vice President Biden wins, what happens the next day? I remember having a conversation with a, a U.S. Uh, flag officer uh, around the time of the, uh, the, the, the Bush-Obama transfer, and we had a long conversation about how the world would be different under, under President Obama. What happens if Vice President Biden 
steps into the Oval Office for America's position in the world? Well, first, um, he engages with the American people in a way that helps bring us back together, that deals with our long unresolved racial uh, inequalities, uh, and puts us on a stronger path towards being a vibrant, effective democracy that allows us to then um, sell the world again on reimagined alliances and partnerships. We need to re-examine NATO, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, uh, I think as it was just put by my friend and colleague, Jane Harmon, uh, dusting off, removing some of the cobwebs, strengthening them. We are in the middle of two ongoing global crises, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. And the United States can retake leadership in a coordinated global response to both. And we can reemerge as an admirable nation that the world looks to as an example and a model if Joe Biden is able to do all of these things quickly, and I believe he is. That's why I support him enthusiastically. All right, our time is up. We could continue for another hour at least. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, sorry if I didn't give each of you as much time to, uh, uh, to, to talk. You all could have had panels by yourself, but I had to do the best I could. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And uh, that was that. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.